Uh, hello to everybody on our conference uh, theta, what, theta flow. The stream flow. Okay. Good. Uh, today our guest lecture is Mary Freeman, class eight auditor, and uh, she is going to tell the lecture of my adventures with LRH, and uh, she was receiving training from LRH. Uh, on um, on the Apollo ship. Okay, now let's uh, get to the lecture from Mary. Okay, well, hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all no, those please. who are listening and thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, thank you, Mikhail, and for putting this on. Thank you, Tatiana for being so good at this translation and, and thanks everyone for coming. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about my adventures with L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, for me, they were adventures. I don't know how much of an adventure it was for him, but <laughs> that's what I'll talk about. Okay, so I'll give you a little uh, introduction as to how I got into Scientology Back, believe this or not, this is like centuries ago, feels like, in 1962. Well, I was in dance class at uh, this particular um, primitive dance class I was taking, and there were, I knew the drummer, and I, I met new friends there, and one of them was a Scientologist, but I didn't know about Scientology. And I thought, she, the thing about her that yeah, was so different yeah, Okay, and she was different from everybody because she had a comm cycle and TRs, which I never saw before in my life. Yeah, so I, I talked to her, I hung around with her, and I wanted to find out why she was so different. And I found out because she told me later on that she was in Scientology, which I had never heard of. So she told me about the ARC triangle and I couldn't believe it because this was New York City where nobody really communicated very well except um, kind of uh, necessity or uh, the people I was with were in, in dance and music and shows and, and they didn't communicate uh, directly from who they were. They would put on a, you know, a, like a show or a beingness. So okay. I was very interested in ARC because of that. Well, I kept her up all night asking her questions and she finally confessed to me that she didn't know everything about Scientology. She was only on the comm course. Well, I thought she was the smartest person uh, I ever met. So then she told me the phone number to call to communicate with the org sec at the New York org. So. I called him in the morning and I said, hello, my name is Mary, I'm a friend of Marion's and, and she told me about Scientology and I want to be a Scientologist. So he said, okay, and I went, oh, he does it too, <laughs> which is this acknowledgement thing. So, okay, so I went to the New York org that morning and I, asked him all my questions and he gave me all the right answers and then I bought a whole bunch of books. Yes, and then within a month, this was August of 1962, so by Labor Day weekend, I decided to go down to the conference that he was holding. It was the Clearing Congress in Washington, D.C. to meet L. Ron Hubbard. Yes, so I went down there and he was giving a lecture. He, it was in a big, I think it was the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C. And uh, he gave a whole big Congress with lots and lots of people. There must have been over a thousand people there. And so he taught us about, he gave a lecture about the problems intensive. He introduced that process, the problems intensive, and he had a chart where he listed out all the buttons. And uh, that was very interesting that he said, yes, and he said, the, uh, he said the little reminder to everyone about the prep check, about the uh, problems intensive, maybe you're not sick, maybe you're just suppressed. 
That was the little motto about the problems intensive. Yes. And then the, when he first came out before that, he came out on the stage in a gold lame jacket, sparkling sort of uh, um, sparkly jacket, gold, and, and a drum roll. And he held up a sore thumb to everyone. He had a big bandage on his thumb. He, he laughed and he showed it to everyone. That was my first time that I ever saw L. Ron Hubbard. He had a sore thumb. So that was very fortunate because from that point forward, I always remembered that he wasn't perfect. And that saved me from becoming a robot. So then he went ahead and he explained uh, what a, a certain level of research he was doing, which he called GPMs, Gold's Problem Mass. He explained that and he had a live demo on the stage of people walking around on the stage in their favorite wrong items from the whole track. Yes, they were in costumes. They were all made up to um, into these favorite lifetimes or beingnesses. It was very interesting to watch that. He, had, he, de he demonstrated how it worked. It was a very high level, but we didn't know that. This was just the, the immediate research he was doing at the time. So then he had us do a drill. Everybody in the uh, Congress that attended had to do a drill that he had pieces of paper with three sheets of paper with phrases that made no sense. And not, there were nonsense phrases. Yes, and I was sitting next to a girl who I didn't know and I was going through the drill. You had to repeat these things to your twin, you twinned up perfectly, perfectly on these nonsense sentences. It was very difficult to duplicate. It was called the duplication drill. And she won the contest. It was a contest and she won. Yep. Yes, her name was Heidi, very dear friend of mine to this day. It, uh, so she, he... won, she won the contest and L LRH, Ron, we called him Ron. He was Ron in those days. He shook her hand. She went up on the stage and he congratulated her. So that was, I thought she was a genius. That was, how, that was how I first saw him. And then we had a reception at the end of the Congress. He did lots of wonderful things. He's talked about all kinds of things, but at the end of the Congress, he had a reception and there was a line of people to meet him. So we all lined up and we walked up to meet him and the, the, the girl in front of me, I didn't know her, but I later on became very good friends with her. Her name was Valerie. I think some of you may know her from a few years ago when she spoke at a convention in, I believe, Moscow. She walked up to him and she said, I will audit. And he said, thank you. He had red hair. He was very um, kind of big and full of power and and he was very impressive at that you know at that reception so that was then i was next and i walked up to him and i shook his hand and i didn't want to say the same thing as valerie said so i just told him kind of casually i'm going to be learning to be an auditor like that and he said thank you and his hair went like that red hair and he acknowledged me so that was how I first met him. And I told him I was going to be an auditor and he acknowledged that. Yeah, and I wanted to be an auditor more than anything because after I read all the books, it confirmed that my, uh, under, what I saw going on in the world was everybody was nuts. So I, somebody had to take care of that. So this is the tech that I read in the book. So I had to learn how to do that so I could have, same people to play with. So I went back to the New York org and I did my some training there, basic, basic courses. And then I ended up in Washington, DC, six months later on the HCA course, uh, HCA and then it was H, uh, HCA, HCA and HPA, level three and four, level three and four. Yes, and that, then I came back to the New York org and I was an auditor and uh, I stayed on staff 
And then a few years later in 1967, um, I went with my husband at that time, Artie, we went to St. Hill. Were you, were you yes, in England, England, East Grinstead. So that's where I did the St. Hill Special Briefing course. And then I did the class seven in, uh, course and internship. Yes, and then when we graduated from the briefing course, we got, we were flown to the ship, to the flagship, which was in Valencia, Spain. Yes, and this, the flagship, which was the, it became the Apollo, at the time it was the Royal Scotman. And that's where I met Ron again. And uh, I got put in a low condition because I made a mistake on the clearing course. I was doing the clearing course and I made a mistake, so I got put in a low condition. So I had to go and do some amends projects and I did the first mailing for the ship. Which, Yes, so I was in liability, so I had to do this amend. So then I saw him on the deck and I said, hello, sir, uh, I want you to know that, oh, I, I said, I, I finished, I finished uh, the uh, amends project and I mailed, I put your first mailing out and he gave me a kiss. He gave me a kiss and thanked me. So then I went down to ethics and I said, I was just kissed by the Commodore. And they said, you're out of liability, you're upgraded, like that, immediately. Yes, yeah, so when I saw him, I asked him, I said, I saw you, I met you back about six years ago, uh, five years ago, in Washington, D.C. He says, yes, that's right. And I said, you mean you remember me from all that time? He said, yes. I said, but I've changed, I'm different now, aren't I? He said, well, your body might have changed, but I remember you. Okay, so then um, within another eight months or so, I went back to St. Hill and continued my class seven internship and all that. And then um, we got, I went, to, I went to Edinburgh, Scotland for my upper levels, OT three, four, five, and original four, five, and six. So when I reached OT six, I was very exterior and it was the best. And I, I was able to decide what I wanted. I made postulates and they all came true. Everything I wished for came true. And that I said to the qual set there at um, Edinburgh, I said, I need my next level of training because I'm at the top now and I need my next level of training. I told him that. And he said, well, that means you need to do the class eight course. I said, that's right. He said, but there is no class eight course. So he said, you'll have to wait until it comes out whenever he releases it. That's when you can do it. Well, because my postulates were working only because of that, that night I got the call from the New York org to go to the ship for the class eight course. My husband, Artie and I went to Greece to Corfu, Greece. We flew there from England and we got on the class eight course. And uh, we were there for about a month because we were a week early. It was supposed to be a three week course, but we were one week early, three week course, but we were there for four weeks. So because we were one week early, which was somebody made a mistake and got in trouble, we had to, the students that were there a week early, we all had to sit and make the packs for the class eight course so we did that for the first week and then we got on course and this was um, a big ship um well pretty big i think it was 250 feet however you translate that anyway and we were down in the um in the classroom and it took another, almost another week to find the right supervisor for the course. Uh, oh yeah, well, we, we were uh, not able to start the course yet because they kept sending supervisors down who couldn't supervise. Yeah, all these supervisors could do, they weren't really trained, but they just yelled at us. They just yelled and they were just mad at us all the time. So nothing happened. So then they sent down, the last supervisor, and his name was Craig DeFan, 
And he jumped up on the desk and he yelled at us again. And we thought, oh, here we go again. But he yelled at us, what's the name of that bulletin? Good, pass. What's the date of that bulletin? Good, pass. So we started signing our check sheets and that's how we started the class eight course. So then we were going along on the course and we were studying together and moving along. And then we saw Ron in the, in the classroom and he was taking pictures of us. And we all stood up at attention. And he said, no, 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 sit down. I'm not the Commodore right now. I'm only the ship's photographer. So then we were auditing. We were trained by him. We had lectures from him every night. And then he would see us our folders and we'd get them back the next morning. Yes. And then if we made a mistake in our auditing, he would say flunk and make some comment. And then he'd say overboard. And we were thrown overboard off the ship. So in the morning, we were woken up at about 6, 6 a.m., banging on our door, muster on the well deck, muster on the well deck. That means gather together on the, on the part of the ship that was a, the deck, part of the deck, to be thrown overboard. So this was in Corfu, Greece. It was beautiful. This was the Mediterranean. It was the first time I was in or saw the Mediterranean. So I was laughing when I was thrown overboard, I was laughing. And then I had to come back and request permission to come aboard. And then he, I was thrown overboard again for laughing. So then all these, these guys in the sea Org were up on the deck going, Mary, laugh, Mary, laugh. You come back when you laugh. And I wouldn't laugh. I said, no, I'm not laughing. And then finally they, could, they said, you can't come back until you laugh. And I went, ha, ha, ha. And they said, okay, we'll take it. Get take her back on the ship. Yeah, so Ron was on the, up on the bridge taking pictures of all this. And the pictures came out in the ouds, the order, orders of the day in the sea work of the class eights being thrown overboard. I remember that. I don't have them. I, I think they were disappeared. They wouldn't want, want anyone to know that we were being thrown overboard. They even denied it. But it's true, oh. I was there. I do have my picture that he took of the class eight. I have my class eight picture. I can show you that. Yeah, so then I was thrown overboard one more time, another time, not the same time. And, uh, and I realized you can't kill a Phaeton. That was my cognition. You know, when you have an engram, you make a postulate. Well, that was my postulate. <laughs> so aside from all this other stuff, we did manage to get some excellent training from Ron. Yes, and he taught us how to get, you know, that we now had to get a floating needle on the rudiments. And he, talk, he talked about the uh, listing and nulling. There's the famous listing and nulling tape from the class A course and LX list and lots of good tech that we learned from him at the lectures at night and in the CSing of our folders. Yes, and then sometimes on course, he would tell us one thing at night he would tell us to do a certain process and the next day we would do that process and then we would be thrown overboard for doing what he told us to do in the previous lecture. So we said to the supervisor, why did he throw us overboard? Why did he flunk us? He told us to do this the day before. And the supervisor said, well, he changed his mind. Yeah, he said he changed his mind. And we said, well, what are we supposed to do? Read his mind? And the supervisor said, yes. So we, but this was because I made a postulate when I first came in. Um, I mean, for me, I said, when I first started in Scientology and I was on the beginning courses at the New York Org, I said, someday I'm gonna work with L. Ron Hubbard and he's gonna teach me and I'm gonna be his guinea pig. And that's exactly what we were. We were guinea pigs. He was doing research, lab rat. So we learned how to do all these new processes that he came out with, and we learned how to supervise because we studied everything he did with us and with three others that were before us. Yes, we, we learned how to do the, the new processes that he gave us and the CSing, the way he CS and supervised the folders. So then when we graduated, he shook our hands 
and he said, a class A could put ethics in anywhere in the world. That's what he said on the class A course. Yes, and I really took that seriously. I really believed it. So um, that's how I ended up doing ethics in the field years later, a few year, couple Actually, of years yeah. later. Okay, so then we went back to the New York org to be the class A, the first class A, it's that would be case supervisors uh, in the tech and qual divisions. Yes, and it was a lot of fun. It was a great staff. It was a huge org, 200 people on staff. And Artie was tech CS and I was qual CS, which is correct, qual is what corrects tech. Now, LRH told us that we were his representatives in the world on the tech. We were his exact, we had to exactly duplicate him to provide and deliver the tech training that we had received. So this was the first time in my life that I was given absolute power. That's what it felt like, absolute power. And this was mo probably the most valuable lesson that I got from L. Ron Hubbard in my life because I did duplicate him and I did see as the way I was trained. And I did the things to the auditors like what he did with us. So the auditors start, you know, they no, no, were no, wait, having- I didn't finish. Oh, sorry. Wait, wait. Yeah. Oh no, the most important lesson of my life was how to handle power. See, because really in my, in my life was to, how to handle power. I duplicated him and I didn't really feel good about it because I didn't want to do to the auditors. I didn't want to go flunk, overboard, low condition, whatever. I didn't want to do that, but I did it. And I had absolute power. Anything I said, everything I said, they would do. So I got sick. I got sick because I was committing an over, even though I was obeying the command line, I got sick. So they, they sent me to AOLA in California to get auditing, a review. Yes. And when I got there, I found Craig DeFan, who was our brilliant supervisor on the class A course. He was the case supervisor at AOLA. So I was able to get really cleaned up because he was the CS. He knew what I was talking about. So while I was in session in my review, I had a missed withhold from the auditor and from everybody. And he had to pull it. And he kept saying, what is it? What is it? I said, I can't tell you. If I tell, I can't tell you this withhold. He said, why? I said, because if I tell you the withhold, I would have to disagree with L. Ron Hubbard. So he said, that's okay, you can tell me, even if it is. I oh, said, no. so I got off my withhold. I said, okay, the withhold is, I disagree with L. Ron Hubbard. So that blew all my charge. I had a pain in my leg, it went away. I was sick, I was got well, everything blew. And I got on a plane and I went back to the New York org. Because okay, so then when I got back to the org, uh, it, there was a staff meeting big staff meeting, all this 200 people on staff. And I had all the auditors seated in the first two rows at the org. So then I indicated to the auditors, I said, um, from this point forward, I am going to change how I am CSing. Because you are the most valuable beings on this planet, there will be no more flunks, no more overboards, no more low condition assignments, uh, no more invalidation. And if you make a mistake, you go to cramming. That's it. Uh, you, so you they blew so know. much. Yeah. And so all the charge blew in the room. All the auditors went way up the tone scale. They were so happy. And they all went into power as auditors within a couple of weeks. Within two weeks, they went into high condition of power as auditors because they felt safe again. Yes, it was great. It was a great experience. And um, my, my husband, Artie, 
My husband said to me, you're canceling overboards? You're canceling flunks? You're canceling low conditions? I said, yes, yes, yes. And then I called all the classmates in the country that were on that course and told them I did that. So what I learned from that about power is that the power formula is all about delegation. So the whole way you get power is you give it away. You, you delegate power and it comes around in a big circle and it comes back to you. So then a couple of months later, Ron came out with Ron's journal 68. And he said in that, it's, it, was a, it was a recording, it was a, a talk, and he said, you know, those class eights that were on the ship and they did the class eight course, they had to run around in these little green boiler suits and get thrown overboard. He said, that was, their tech wasn't so bad. It wasn't a polite thing to do. So that came back, you see, so that I could now agree with L. Ron Hubbard. I was back in agreement. And I was very grateful that I got that lesson from him. Because if those things had not happened on the ship and I disagreed with it and then I had to get my integrity back, I would not have learned that lesson. Yes, that was the most valuable lesson of my life, how to deal with power. Okay, so that I thought it's possible maybe later, much later, I thought, I wonder if he heard that I did that because maybe that made him decide to indicate that it wasn't exactly the right thing with the class eights. Maybe he got that because I did that and I made it very public. I called all the orgs, every CS, you know, it's possible that he found out. Yeah, so that was, um, that was the whole story from the class eight course. And uh, then the next time I had any dealings with Ron was in 1973, but I didn't see him in person, but we did, David Miscavige's father, Ron Miscavige, was in, at St. Hill. I went back to St. Hill, I went back to St. Hill for a little auditing because it was better, way better prices than in the United States. Yeah, so a group of us went to St. Hill from, from, California, because by that time we were there, and um, and we I, we got auditing at St. Hill. But then Ron Miscavige's father was there. He had a group in East Grinstead of musicians, and they were playing in a pub, playing every few every weekend or whatever in a pub. Started singing with them, and then he left England, and then the rest of the musicians and I got a job in East Grinstead in another pub every Saturday night singing and you know playing music and they were dancing and it was a party every Saturday and so uh we decided to do a special concert even because we were a group of musicians we decided to put together a show at the theater in East Grinstead which was going to be a Narconon benefit show and we invited everybody in East Grinstead to come to that theater, including, of course, St. Hill people. And they enjoyed it very much. It became very well known that we did this concert for the town of East Grinstead. And, uh, and I even made a joke about Scientology in one of the dances that we were doing. It was just a lot of fun. Yeah, and before that, before that, St. Hill had a, not a good reputation in East Grinstead. They thought that St. Hill was, um, you know, a crazy place. But after we did this concert, the PR of Scientology went up. Yeah, the reputation was improved. And then Ron found out about this, and uh, there was a problem. He solved the problem that the musicians who were staff members were having at the time, uh, they were being commaved, if you know what that means, put on trial. Anyway, because they were moonlighting, they were, they were doing another job besides their regular job on post. Yeah, so they didn't know, they didn't know what to do, but we kept working. And then Ron 
decided, he found out what happened with this concert and with our regular job of singing and playing music. And he commended, he sent down commendations to all of us and wiped out our ethics file, including the comments on the musicians. So then uh, that was a happy ending to the whole thing. And I went back to the States after that. And then I was, I was auditing at AOLA and ASHO and different orgs. I would never join the Sea Org, never, never join the Sea Org, but I was auditing in the Sea Orgs. And I was also performing in a theater at the same time, so I was very busy. But I started finding out that people who were, for reasons, um, other reasons, they weren't doing, the OTs, my friends, needed some kind of help. And so I started doing ethics in the field as well. Yes, and the ethics in the field started going very well. And I developed the ethics program, which I'll tell you about tomorrow, um, but, and how it all started and how, what happened with it. And, um, you know, I continued to deliver the ethics in the field and the orgs didn't like it. Yeah. And I was training people to deliver this program because the demand was very high and I could not fill all the, uh, all this, this, the demands. So I, I had people that I was training to do this. So they were investigating me and people were coming to the investigations and telling them their wins and their success stories, but it didn't matter. The only thing they couldn't really hit me hard because my stats were up because I made my stat number of people back online onto their next service. Mm -hmm. The org still didn't like it because it was competition, I guess, you know, but whatever. But it was win. Everybody no, 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 got a win. So a bunch of the people that I was uh, work that I trained took up a collection and they sent me to flag in Florida and Clearwater to get permission to see the people there that could get me L. Ron Hubbard's approval for my ethics program. So I went to the first, for the first time, I was in Clearwater at, at the Fort Harrison flag land base. And um, I had a CSW, a completed staff work with all the win success stories, my hat write up, everything. And I handed it to LRH personal, uh, public relations officer or whatever, I, a high official under LRH, and I handed it to her to get uh, permission or approval from L. Ron Hubbard for my program. Yeah, well, it took a while. It took a few, a week or two maybe, and I was out there around the pool, you know, sitting around relaxing, talking to my friends, and then Liz came down, the, the, the representative from LRH came down and handed me my petition and she said, Mary Marin, don't ever lose your balls. Testicular. Yeah. And he, she said, you can go ahead and train these people. You can do it. So around the swimming pool, I trained up a whole bunch of people to do the ethics program at, at the Fort Harrison. So that was a happy ending to that part of the story. Yeah. So I would, I don't know, maybe I should end off here today. Um, I could ask some questions though. Tomorrow, if you want to ask questions, I will answer. But tomorrow I will talk about the ethics program. Any questions? Maxim Lebedev asks, here's one of the most important question. When and how have you, uh, have you, uh, join the free zone of Scientology. Well, that was because I resigned from the Church of Scientology in 1983. And I found out about David Mayo. After I resigned, I found out about David Mayo that he opened a, uh, an advanced uh, ability center for uh, like AO in uh, Santa Barbara, California. By that time, I was with Frankie and we drove out to California and we were in, I was back in New York. Oh, well, you know, how did, I left the church because they wanted me to turn over all my friends' names who said bad things about upper management. So I resigned and I sent letters out to 40 people, staff members, all the way up to LRH, 
that I was resigning because I, I wrote down that the Church of Scientology was no longer capable of, of delivering the technology of L. Ron Hubbard. So when I resigned, everybody found out, of course, I did not get declared. They were threatening me with comments and declares, and I said, uh, do what you have to do. And I resigned. And then all, when I walked out of the church, I, I mean, I walked out of Scientology. It was like my life was almost over. And I, walked, I felt like I was walking through the black door. And what happened? On the other side, all the SPs called me up and took me out to dinner. Now, you have to remember that only two and a half percent of the entire population of the world are SPs. How did they all wind up in the Church of Scientology? Yeah, these people were not SPs. They were my friends. And they were people that were very valuable. Right. So um, one of those people was Frankie. And we got together and we stayed together ever since, um, up until two and a half years ago, almost three years ago, when he passed on. But, um, you know, 34 years. And we continued doing the tech. Now we we went out, we drove out to California to deliver the tech with David Mayo, and he was L. Ron Hubbard's top tech man in the world. He was the CS worldwide, the senior CS of Scientology worldwide, and L. Ron Hubbard's auditor. Yeah, and David Miscavige had declared him SP. He was an SP. That's an insult to LRH, who hired him in the first place to be his top tech terminal and his auditor. An insult to LRH. And I tell you, SP, the word suppressive person, is the biggest wrong item I think anybody has ever delivered, enforced on people on the planet. SP. The church is guilty of declaring people in wrong items and giving them wrong items and they have been dramatizing outless phenomena ever since. Mary, did you want to uh, continue with the previous one or are you ready to hear the next question? Oh, well, if I answered his question, I mean, after that, there were lots of things that I did in the field and I ended up connecting with people in the free zone. And I mean, it all kind of continued that way, but Anyway, that's okay. I have endless stories. I could stay here all day. Mary, here's the next question. Alexei Sergeyev. Alexei Sergeyev what, what is your main purpose as a Satan of, uh, uh, on, uh, on, on your seventh dynamic, right? Seventh dynamic. Bring sanity to the game. Каких своих соратников ты бы выделила как сильных, талантливых личностей, кроме ЛРХ и Мэрисью? Who would be the most valuable people of uh, uh, co-worker with uh, LRH? Uh, who would you, who you would name bes besides LRH himself and uh, Mary Sue? Who, who would be when I was in the church or after? Who, whoever you want to name in church or ever, most valuable people. David Mayo, Craig DeFan who was our supervisor on the class eight course. I don't know where these people are now. David Mayo is gone, he He's passed gone. on. Frankie, my, my husband, um, gosh, I have so many friends. Uh, there's so many valuable people. They're right on this phone call with us now too. This is conference. Um, people close to me, my friends, and uh, the people that are continuing the tech to deliver the tech in the world the Lembergers in Israel and, and, and Sonia and her people in, in South Africa and Anita and Les Warren here in, in Idaho and uh, Trey down, Trey Lots down in California, uh, and Max and Erica, all the people that are delivering technology are the most valuable in this subject that I have seen because they're, per, they're persisting, they're continuing. Thank you. And Thank also, you. Mikhail, for, Mikhail, for doing these conferences. You know, I, I don't want to leave anybody. When you start naming names, you end up leaving people out, and that's not good either. So, uh, you know, 
Marianne Hagen, um, the people that are delivering the technology and, and making a big difference, those are the people. And uh, I'm sure there's many more that I didn't mention. Pat Krennic. Phil, Phil Spickler. Phil, no. oh, Phil Spickler. Oh my God, Phil Spickler. Yes, I remember Phil Spickler. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Mary, where are you on the bridge right now? And what have you received from uh, doing the bridge? Okay, well, I'm doing some auditing, co-auditing um, with Joe on um, OT, on Captain Bill's bridge. We're, we're working on OT 13, 12 and 13. We're going to be studying the next level up after that. We're continuing on uh, catching up over many years of not getting things uh, lined up properly because I was doing other things. But it's going well. And um, what I've gotten from it is states like what Mikhail talks about, Omni State. I have that pretty much obviously when, when I want to go there. You can't always run everything from Omni State all the time because. <laughs> There's more immediate things that you have to do, you know, in the kitchen. And uh, <laughs> so, um, but very, um, like, things that I want to have happen, like when I would did the OT6 and I told you my postulates worked, that keeps happening. My postulates kind of unravel in front of me like a red carpet. I feel like life is going the way it's supposed to go and it's fun and it's good and more more theta coming into my life and into the people that i know all the time more theta okay thank you uh next question mary do you still have a spiritual connection with lrh sometimes not constantly but i've had some def i've had some Maybe when I was a couple of times when I was asleep, I felt like I was connected up uh, in communication. And I find other times that I get little connections with him. It's hard to explain. It's not like a whole big long conversation. Thank you. Next question from Danny. Uh, hi, Mary. When was the last time you saw Ron Hubbard? According to your information, when do you believe Ron left his body? Officially 1986, but some claim he left earlier. Um, well, the last time I saw Ron in person, in the physical universe in person, would have been that the class eight course, because after that it was communication on the, um, you know, on written lines and stuff like that. I wrote to him, he wrote me back. I got my petition to him. He acknowledged it, you know, in this late 70s. Uh, I was in communication with him. But the last time I saw him in person was on the Class 8 course. I think he left his body. I think he left his body unofficially before he, the body died. I think it was the early 80s, 81, 82, maybe around that time, that I think he left. Because he said he was leaving. He did say that. Thank you. Um, Mary, are you, uh, do you, do you know those people, uh, Tommy Thompson or uh, Pierre Ether? Pierre. I know, I don't know Tommy Thompson personally, although I certainly have heard about him. I might have been in common with him a little bit on email or something, but I have not met him that I know hey, of. Yeah. And uh, Pierre, I never met in person, but I spent a long time on the phone with him back around 2007 or eight, maybe 2008. I, I spent a long time on the phone with him talking about uh, Excalibur because he disagreed with it. And then I, I handled it with him. And he said I was a standard tech auditor. Thank you. Evgeny Nikolaev asks you, uh, what would you suggest to the younger generation uh, in order to disseminate Scientology uh, more successfully? Get trained. 
become an auditor or get auditor training. You don't have to be a professional auditor, but you should get auditor training, get the tech. Thank you. Uh, next questions, question is uh, from Jesus Guzman. Mary, could you tell us your experience in the development of OT3? Uh, I was never uh, in the Sea Org. He was developing OT3 on the ship. Um, I wasn't there. He came out with it around 1967. And at first it was backwards and then he reversed it. Thank you. Andre Fideyev, I uh, want to tell, uh, thank you very much for a bunch of theta. Okay, and uh, it was just a, a message. Uh, next question. Uh, Mary, have you uh, happened to know Bill Robertson and what was his position uh, b beside, uh, on the side of LRH, with LRH, what was his uh, post? Well, he had many different posts. He, I met him at St. Hill in the 60s. Uh, he yeah. was playing his guitar and walking around St. Hill and getting trained and everything. Um, yes, then I met him again. Yeah, I met yeah. him in, in 1969. I met him at AOLA. Uh, he was there with his wife running AOLA. And Frankie was there and we were friends. Yeah, he was running, he was the head the CEO or whatever of AOUK in Edinburgh before I got there in 1968. He was running that, he was on post. And then after that, he was in LA on post at AOLA as the uh, CEO there. And then he was in the Sea Org doing whatever LRH wanted him to do in the Sea Org, but he was, okay. He was pretty much LRH's right-hand man, uh, most trusted friend and Sea Org member for the whole time he was in the church. Thank you. Следующий uh, вопрос. Mary, do you think it's uh, possible uh, using the Scientology tech handle such a psychiatry condition as... Uh, bipolar. Bipolar, bipolar uh, affective uh, disease, maybe like this. Yeah, disorder or something. You mean multiple personality disorder? Kind of, yeah. It depends on the person. It depends on the individual. How much he can... Yeah, it depends on the individual. On what he can confront. Okay, thank you. Следующий вопрос, Николай Костров. Can I answer a little bit more, a little bit more on the previous yeah. question? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. On what they can confront Mostly, you would go back to, if they can do it, you would try to get them back to early trauma, early engram, engramic material, early in their life. Okay, thank you. Следующий вопрос прошла ли ты уровень ноты? Have you done the level of nuts? Yes, I absolutely did not, and I see yes it. Thank you. Uh, next question is from, question from Jonathan Burke. Uh, Mary, can you go into detail on what you gained from studying LRH sessions on the class A course? How to put 12 exclamation points after the word flunk. Uh, I learned how to CS sessions in a specific order of, of priorities, you know, looking for out tech and looking for things done accurately or not accurately, the standard way that you would study the sessions that are provided to see how he CS'd it. I mean, it, it was common sense if, if you leave out the exclamation points. You know, you look, for, you look for the amount of tone arm motion in the session. This is standard CSing. I mean, you look for if the auditor did the actions properly, if the things that were run were reading, if, if you can read the handwriting, uh, things like that. So is he the, maybe I should get a specific question, more specific question, what I learned from CSing. You know, the, the, what he taught us on the ship was the laws of listing and nulling, the LX list, when to insert that into the program, what, what to look for, things like that. It's technical stuff, LX. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Следующий uh, вопрос. 
Mary, what is the main difference be, uh, on the level of uh, OT8 for, uh, between the old bridge and the previous? This is a funny question because there is no, uh, there is not only one old bridge. There is so many. There are so many bridges. I don't know how you are going to answer this question, but what's the main difference between OT8 on the old bridge and on the present time bridge? Well, uh, the OT8 on the old bridge, I am not familiar with. I only went up to OT6 on the original bridge. There was no OT8. It was it stopped at OT6, but then he started. OT7, which was really lower than OT6. What, what about the present time bridge? Can you compare? OT8 it? now is just the, uh, the final part of Excalibur, OT life repair. Vidimo, full, full track? You're talking about full track? Not getting into any confidential stuff. No, no just OT, it's the last part of Excalibur. But last in the church, time. In the church, I don't know what, uh, there's so many different versions of OT8 in the church, and I have not seen any, I haven't seen much result from it, of anything really major. Any product. <laughs> no, nothing. Uh, Captain Bill put the boots on. He put the boots on and continued the technology above OT7, uh, church version, the solo knots. He recreated so OT5, really, well, 5, 6, and 7 into Excalibur. Um, he put the boots on that he had to continue the, this research and the development of the tech. I don't know anybody else who has done it at that level of responsibility and consistency. Thank you. Следующий uh, вопрос. Here's a personal question to you, Mary. How successful you are on uh, developing all your eight dynamics? <laughs> I don't know. I'm too busy on the third. <laughs> uh, the first is pretty good. It's going well. Uh, I guess the second is on hold for a while. The third is going very well. The, the fourth is a big challenge. Okay, thank you. This is Kabuki. Good to yours. Six dynamic. Well, no, сейчас я вам покажу мою шестую динамику. Вот мое окружение. Это моя физическая вселенная. Six dynamic. More fifth out there. А он там еще побольше пятой динамики за за окном. Sixth dynamic is good. I, I like my sixth dynamic. Seventh is all the time, all the time. Seventh dynamic. That's going very well. I have very close connections to the seventh dynamic um, theta. It's great. Yeah, and the eighth dynamic is alive and well inside all the rest of my dynamics. I'm in good communication with my inner static. Good, thank you. Here is a message. Thank you for sharing some of your story with us, Mary. It's great to reach a level of competence in a subject whereby you can originate your own contribution in the form of your ethics program and have it duplicated and understood. The main thing that I can take away with me from your story is the simplicity of duplication. For me, both Axiom 28, which result, results in duplication, and Axiom 28 amended, which results in duplication with understanding, are valid. They define different processes. Uh, Thank you. Next question. LRH said he would leave us but come back. Is he back? Um, it's hard to be sure exactly how he's doing that, you see, because he has, he has communication, as far as I know, from people who tell me that they are able to connect with him and how if he's doing it multiple ways, or if he's doing it in one body only, uh, if there's more than one way that he's 
but I know he's in communication with various people that have told me and some who are very intimately connected with him. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Different ways. Maybe, you know, you can't always be sure how he's doing it. That's all. Thank you. Next question. It, uh, this is continued from uh, about Axiom 28. What is your position on Axiom 28 and Axiom 28 amended? Well, my, what is my position on Axiom 28 and Axiom 28 amended? I don't know too much about Axiom 28 amended. I know the axioms that came out from L. Ron Hubbard. Axiom 28 is Axiom 28. It's communication, an impulse or particle that is goes from the source point across the distance to receive point and the intention is to bring about a duplication at the receive point of what emanated from the source point so that's what i know about axiom 28 if you want to communicate you have to make it real to the other person you have to get a duplication it's it's useless to communicate if you're not going to um if you're not going to be real to the person, they won't hear you. They will not hear you. Okay. Mary, we uh, lost your uh, video. I know because my, my battery ran out. I, I have to go on my iPhone. Okay. okay. You know what I'll do? I'll, I'll take my iPad upstairs and I'll plug it into the charger upstairs and that should handle it. Okay. Good. Now we can see Mary. Yes. Uh, I'm up and it's charging. Good. Uh, next question. Это Айваска или это из Перу? What would you say about Айваска? Айваска, do you know what is this? From Peru. Is this question must from, be from Ned. From Peru? Peru. From Peru, something. Peru Peruvian Indians using this for yeah, uh, no, spiritual. No, Ayahuasca. Yeah, I heard, I heard about that. I don't, I have not tried it. <laughs> I don't, um, there's a, you know, there have been many psychedelic, several psychedelic chemicals that people have taken. Also, natural things from plants that open up different parts of the brain and give you different perceptions. And it bypasses yeah, the body's limits. It's another practice. It is another practice. There are many other practices. And there are there are chemicals from plants natural and synthetic that open up the pineal gland and open up perception outside of the body the gland, pineal, the, pineal gland pineal gland third eye yeah and uh, these are practices that can be very interesting some of them can be um you know harmful some of them can be beneficial but they don't give you a practical application they do not give you a practical application like Scientology. Scientology tech is unique because it takes from the uh, infinite spiritual theta universe and allows it to be accessed into the physical and applied to the physical universe into the game. If you want to leave the game, if you want to leave the game, then there's all kinds of things you can do. But to have a viable game, LRH and CBR have accessed the truth on higher levels and funneled them, channeled them into use on this level of the playing field. Yeah, you don't have to sit on a mountaintop to get enlightenment. You can you can do it in your own home with your friends or on in in classroom. It's immediately available. Thank you. Следующий uh, вопрос. Mary, can you say uh, something about the importance on on the bridge, the grades five, six, and seven? In some orgs of the free zone, they are not being even delivered. For some reason, they go from clear and then jump over and then start lucky levels. But the five, six, and seven, they are uh, left out. They are not okay. being delivered in some orgs. Okay, five is power processing. Five and five a. And that is available for people who do not go clear on Dianetics. Also, the power processes are available and CS'd for and audited on some of the upper CBR 
in Excalibur and where it's needed on upper levels. You, it can be used, but it's used in a certain way. Okay, now original grade six was R6EW, it was called R6EW. Um, EW means N words. And it was used for people who were going to go on to the clearing course who are not clear. Uh, because there are so many clears made on Dianetics, then it fell out of use. Uh, grade seven was the clearing course originally, and that has fell, fallen out of use mostly because people got clear on Dianetics. However, the clearing course has been CS4 and used on certain, uh, in certain ways in upper level CSing as needed. Okay, next question. What we do about not having LRH sessions to study at class eight in the field? I don't know. Um, where the folders are, I don't know. There might be someone who, you have to find out if somebody archived them. I do not know who archived the LRH original folders, which would have been my class eight course. I, I don't know of any source for that. And the church has stopped delivering the class eight course. And I don't know where it is delivered in, in the field. I don't know who's delivering the class eight course as a course. Uh, they must have the tapes of, the, you know, the lectures from LRH. I don't know where the CSs are. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mary, Kakovo. Mary, how would you evaluate the, L, the C, CBR preach? Uh, do you consider it uh, the only right preach, the only correct? I would say at this, it, it seems to be the only correct bridge beyond the regular LRH bridge up to where it starts with Captain Bill. I would say Captain Bill developed the bridge correctly. Thank you. Тут сообщение. Мэри, вы освещаете этот мир. Спасибо вам. Mary, you are bringing the light to this world. You are inviting oh. the world. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. In the meantime, uh, could we acknowledge Tatiana for doing a wonderful job with translations? Yes. Somebody said thank you for, for my translation. Okay, thank you. Okay. Так, идем дальше. Mary, I, uh, you are awesome. Thank you so much for your time and for your answers. From my Very end. welcome. It was a pleasure. It was fun. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Mary, thank you very much for a huge amount of data from Yelena. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the conference. Very interesting and uh, knowledgeable uh, and especially uh, enjoy, uh, we especially enjoyed seeing the person who knew LRH. Oh, good. Спасибо. Okay, хорошо. Welcome. И uh, последнее сообщение, больше нет. Uh, thank you very much, Mary, for talking to us. I look forward to tomorrow's talk. Thank you, Mikhail, for organizing all this. Great to see all of you. See you tomorrow. Uh, Mary Blackford. Okay. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. Thank you, Mary. It was a pleasure to see you again. Oh, it's a lot of fun. I'm so glad we're working together on this. You look wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Bye. Okay. So that's about it for today. I uh, thank you very much, everybody who joined us. We expect to see you all tomorrow on uh, continuation of our conference and uh, listen to uh, Mary's lecture on ethics program. And here you can see the uh, requisites. Uh, uh, which can be used if you'd like to support our conference. You can make a screenshot or uh, take a picture from your phone and uh, use the, the requisites. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and uh, see you tomorrow. Big thanks to Tatiana for translation and uh, Mary for her wonderful lecture.
Okay, that's all for today. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.